Thank you so much for joining me. Everybody, welcome to the Copy Blogger Podcast. My name is Tim Stoddard, and my guest this week, Jose Rosado. What's up, man? Great to see you. It's doing, I'm doing great, my friend. Um, just had a few amazing calls before this call, and I'm excited. Thank you so much for inviting me. My pleasure. We have a mutual acquaintance, actually. Um, my recent partner in my company in well in copy blogger academy specifically a guy named charles miller yeah uh he got his inspiration from you he told me that you were the reason that uh he got involved in well he's involved in a bunch of stuff now but just writing online is is really where Amazing. where he got that start that. and Thank as soon as you said that i was like oh man jose is so good i didn't know thank you for letting me know that because I've been following him for like three or four years, something like that. And I've connected with them, like on the chat, uh, chatting with them, but I've never actually had like a one-on-one -on -one like this with them, but it's, thank you for letting me know that. I'll just reach out and say thank you and like find a way to have a quick call with him at least. Yeah, he, he legit said that you were the reason why, uh, why he <clears throat> just got started, why he Amazing. went for it. So. I just thought you'd want to know that it makes me feel good because sometimes we're all in our own little bubbles, you know, and I forget sometimes that the stuff I put out there affects people emotionally. And it's silly that I would forget that because I read other people's stuff. Like for me, it was always Brian Clark. Right. And, and sometimes I still feel like a fanboy, even though it's like my friend now. Um, but nonetheless, I always appreciate when people say that stuff to me. So uh, I hope that makes you feel good. Oh, super good. My friend, it's always a pleasure to hear that people get inspired or the things that we do online, which always, we need that, right? Yeah. We online, we need that. Despite, despite whatever people think about us, because we have 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 followers, um, we still need the little encouragement, right? And I appreciate you um, highlighting that. My pleasure. Well, uh, let's get into it. One of the things I've always appreciated about you is you are sort of this perfect example. And I mean, this is a compliment, by the way, it might come across like a backhanded compliment, but you you are this perfect example of like, if I can do it, anybody can do it. English isn't even your first language. Um, with respect, I'm sure like dealing with internet connections and stuff like that was, was probably a challenge when, when you were first getting started. But nonetheless, here you are, you're, you're by far one of the most authoritative examples about content creation and, and putting your name out there and, and building a brand around your name. So I, I want to start just a little bit of a of an open ended platform for you to to tell people a bit about your journey, because in your case in particular, I think your journey is like it hits home a lot. And I think a lot of people can benefit from it. I got an email on a Thursday. <laughs> this was back in my nine to five job. The email said the company must survive. That's like the subject line. And I'm like, ah, it's one of these bullshit emails that you always get from human resources. Then I see people pacing and I'm like, what the hell is happening? And I opened the email due to the, to the curiosity and like, I felt something dropping. I don't know. It's like a, a chill on your spine. They were saying right there in the freaking email, we have to fire downsize because they don't use fire. We have to downsize. 50% of the company to survive. And I'm like, nah, not me. I just recently, I just, I, they, they gave me a promotion like a few weeks ago before that, right? And I'm like, no, nah, I'm just marketing director. They need marketing, right? My wife had quit her job because I was given a substantial raise. Next day I got canned, just like that. Wow. So I'm, I'm going to, to my home. <laughs> I open the door and the first thing I see is my little six month year old, ah, you know, like they're crawling and I'm like, oh sh crap, I'm, I'm, I'm screwed. That's how my, basically my, how my career started. This was like 2015, 2016. I always get the, the date wrong, but I got started with like real freelancing back then. And thanks to that freelancing experience, I'm here today because without it, I wouldn't even dare posting stuff online. How? With what skills? Which, which, what clients? I built my client base from 2016 to 2018, more or less. And that gave me the courage to get started online. But I started online out of desperation. 
I didn't know what to say nor how to say it and in a second language. And thankfully, I've known English for, the, for, like, for my whole life. But speaking it, it's very different. And writing it, oh I'm my God, a different yeah. skill set. Hearing it, understanding it, reading it, easy. But, huh. dude, I just wrote everything in Spanish and used Google Translate to get the English right. That's how I started on Twitter <laughs> back in 2018. You should see it. Well, you Google Translate that. wasn't as good in yeah, 2018. It wasn't. Like, but since yeah, I already the had like English and skills, stuff. but that's how mm -hmm. I started. That's how I started. So when you say, if this guy can do it, I can do it. Well, uh, yeah, that is, there's a sense of truth there. And I always tell my, my students from the United States, dude, like, look at me. I'm second language. English as a second language, living in a very poor country. I'm not poor by any means, right? But people pay me a lot of money to create their stuff. You have the privilege to live in a country that, you know, it's the, the, the number one according to, to stats, right? What makes you think that you can't survive? What makes you think that you can't win online when you have the underdog, Jose Rosal, winning online somehow, right? And it's now showing you what he did so you can more or less imitate what he did, right? So that's more or less my journey um, here. And since 2018, I've been posting like almost every day. I've recently, for the first time in like five years, haven't posted daily on Twitter <laughs> because I'm, I've been very busy uh, fixing a few things in my business. But um, I do believe that I'm here because of two things. First, just doing it. Despite the limitations in language, despite the limitations in like diff uh, cultural differences, just doing it. I'm mean, using Google Translate to get the English right. And the second one is consistency, which is what a lot yeah. of people fail at. They think that, oh, I'm going to post for one day, a month, two months, but they don't see that. All of these guys that they admire, it's 12 months of daily grinding, daily posting, daily engaging, engagement. Like, for example, you and I, when you followed me a few months ago, right, like a year ago, we hopped on a call, right? I told you, ah, let's talk, let's talk. And we hopped on a call. I remember you were like going to the gym or something like that. And we, and we had like a 15 minute call right there because I just told you, hey, let's hop on a call. And you agreed and now we're here, right? So when you mix these, these things, just doing it and a little bit of consistency, dude, most people are lazy. So you already have like 80% of the game. 80% of the game comes for that. So it's one of the key learnings that no matter who you talk with, they always tell you consistency is the key, right? So there's a lesson, and there's a lesson in repeating that, which takes me to what is posting online? It's saying the same shit over and over and over again with different words. You might know that because, you know, with copywriting, copyblogger, and all these things, what is copywriting? It's saying what people are thinking in text to get them to uh, convert, to click to buy, to do something, right? All through your, all through the power of repeating the same things that you've repeated over the years. Same formula, same tactics, different words. Same ideas, different words. And it's one of the, the key uh, things about social media that people don't understand. If you want to grow on social, you want to monetize it, it's repeating the same things over and over again. Is it boring? Yes, but you know what's boring? Commuting to your job for two hours, that is, I don't like that. <laughs> and I don't know anyone who loves commuting. So what can I tell you? It's been a really nice journey with ups and downs. Not every year is like oh, making a lot of money. But I would. my dad once told me like, Jose, would you go back to a nine to five job? And I told him, I'd rather die. <laughs> I'd rather die. I, it's not because I hated my jobs. I loved every single one of my jobs because people were nice. I had the privilege to work with amazing bosses, but having to ask for permission, my friend. Hey yeah. boss, can I go on the vacation? Hey, can I go fix the LDD? Whatever happened, some pipe bursted in my home. I just couldn't get myself to, hey, give me permission to do that. I hated that. Today in age, the only person I have to ask for, for permission is my credit card. Can I, should I really do this? Yes. Okay, swiped, that's it. And now um, my wife is also into, into entrepreneurship. So we both found a way to become entrepreneurs. And I, I love it. I love it. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. Hey there, it's Tim. And I need to take a moment to tell you about this show's sponsor. It's a product called Hype Fury. When I was able to speak to Yannick, uh, who is the CMO, one of the founding partners of Hype Fury, and he agreed to sponsor the show, I was so thrilled. And the reason 
is because I have personally used Hype Fury for the last three years, and it has allowed me to build my social media following and my personal brand to over 70,000 followers. I could not have done it without Hype Fury. And I, I really, really mean that. I use this product every day, and it's added so much to my business and to my life. So Hype Fury is a social media scheduling tool. It has three main features that I think separates it from every other tool. One, it, it allows you to quickly create content and schedule them. So it's a very nuanced feature, but it's so helpful. Basically, I, I sit down at my desk in the morning and I type out my tweet, I type out my LinkedIn post, and then all I do is I hit enter and Hype Fury schedules it at the opportune time on Twitter and on LinkedIn. I don't have to think about it any more than that. All I have to do is sit down and create my tweets, create my posts, hit enter, and Hype Fury does all the work for me. Uh, second, Hype Fury makes it so that you can easily create threads. And threads have been the biggest value add for me in growing my following. So threads really helped me grow my following on Twitter. And those threads format themselves into longer form LinkedIn posts on LinkedIn. It's actually kind of funny. I made a video about this not too long ago about how, yes, like you want to create threads on Twitter. You want to be a thread boy because I'd say like 80% of my growth on both Twitter and LinkedIn have been from threads and long form posts. And I wouldn't have been able to format any of this without using Hype Fury. Uh, and then third, Hype Fury is really good for keeping you inspired. So what it does is it it shows you some of your most popular tweets and your most popular posts. And it, it basically gives you information. It gives you inspiration as to what your audience is looking for and what they most actively engage in. So you're never sitting at the computer thinking, oh man, like, what am I going to say today? What, you know, what kind of content am I going to create today? It's constantly feeding you new ideas, new inspiration, and it allows you to to quickly create this content so that you can continuously get yourself out there, continuously build your brand, and most importantly, turn that social media following into newsletter subscribers. So through Hype Fury, I've been able to grow my personal email list, timstods.com, to over 30,000 followers. That's turned into a business within itself. It's really helped me grow the Copy Blogger newsletter. We're at 110,000 followers right now. A whole lot of that is, is also because of Hype Fury. So please, this is a product that I use every single day. I personally vouch for it. You can check it out at hypefury.com. H-Y-P-E-F-U-R-Y.com. And if you have any problems with it, you can send me a DM on Twitter and I'm sure I can convince you as to why it will add value to your life. So hypefury.com. Thank you so much to Hype Fury for sponsoring the show. And let's get back to the episode. There's a lot of directions that in that opening monologue, let's call it, you hinted on like all three of the major topics that I wanted to talk about. So I'm going to introduce one so that I remember to come back to it, but then I'm going to break off with a, a quick little story, which I think you'll appreciate. Um, one of the things that I think you do so well is really use, whether it's Instagram or whatever the platform, it doesn't matter. You're not afraid to go to that next little step of relationship building. Like I remember when you said, let's jump on a call. And I'm like, what do you want my phone number? And you're like, no, dude, just push the button on Instagram. And I didn't even know that you could do that. And, um, and I remember you're right. I, I wasn't going to the gym. I was going to my, well, my Muay Thai gym. Cause I, I train a lot. And I remember getting off the phone and just thinking to myself, no one's ever done that to me before where it was like, oh, cool. We're chatting in the DMs, right? Like, let's level this thing up one more. And I think that that has been something that I learned from you. But more importantly, it, what was it? It was like a, a proof positive case study that like, wow, I noticed that I felt like I just got to know you a lot more. You weren't just some person on the other end of like a social media screen. Like now all of a sudden you were my friend, you were my buddy. And it's, it's not like we're best friends, but from that point forward, I could just message you about anything and we could just talk, you know? So I loved that. And I want to get back to that, man. I'm, I'm putting that on ice for just a split second because you said permission. And I, I haven't really shared this too often, but the moment I knew that I 
was the entrepreneurial type was I was in high school and my father worked at the airport. The airport is in South Philly and my family grew up in like Northwest Philly and on the Northwest side of the city. And he was one of the guys that threw the suitcases underneath the bags of airplanes, um, luggage handlers, basically. And he worked there for 20 years. He was in the union. He like built himself up to this position in the union that he was really proud of. And um, after 9-11, it was, it was just like that, like 9-11 happened. And then like a week later, my dad's job was just gone. And I remember drive, well, I was on my skateboard actually. And I had one of those like Nokia cell phones, right? That we had when we were in high school. And he called me and he just told me the story. And there was something about that moment where I knew that like that terrible thing was actually like a really important moment in my life where this terrible thing was was a good thing. I was a little bit younger. Well, I was a lot younger then, right? But um, just a little more naive, I think I would say. And I, I didn't even then appreciate how much of importance that bad thing was to propel me to like what I was supposed to do. So I know I kind of have two questions here, right? I want to talk about your ability to call people and make real relationships with people, which I think is a lot more rare than you think. But even before that, let's harp on this. That bad thing you had, you come home, you see your six-month-old. It's like, damn, I need to figure this out. Did you know then that that was like an important moment in your life or was it just all, all panic, <laughs> all panic and fear? It took 30 days for me to actually like, oh crap, <laughs> I am screwed. <laughs> 30 days after getting fired was when I actually said, I have to do something. So I spent those 30 yeah. days just de decompressing which was kind of dumb, to be honest. I should have taken action right away. Those 30 days, like literally on the 27th, 30th day after getting fired, I had one of the worst anxiety attacks that I've ever had. That shit runs in my family. So I, I'm not new to anxiety. Yeah. Um, but knowing that I don't have resources, I don't have a job, I have a six-month-old, my wife just had just quit her job. So we were both jobless knowing that I failed my wife, let me take it to even bigger stakes. My father-in-law is, he's, he, he does great in life. I always tell him like, you're a rich dude. Like stop, stop complaining about money because he loves complaining about money, but he's a rich people sometimes do that. Right. And I'm like telling my wife, Brenda, I took a princess out of a castle and put her under a rock. That is like literally what I told her and how I felt. I failed my wife. I felt like it. And I failed someone that I admire a lot, which is my father-in-law. I'm one of these people that is lucky enough to have like two parents-in-law that I love. I love my, my mom, my dad. And I also love my uh, Don Frank. His, his name is Frank. And Fidelina, um, her name, um, my wife's mom, who I adore. I failed them too. So it's not only a failure from my side. And I'm like, 30 days later, anxiety. I'm, I'm screwed. But then, then thankfully, I had done a little bit of like freelancing work before that. So I had a few websites under my belt. I'm, I'm a graphic designer, web designer back then. And I had a few proof of, of my competence. So I grabbed like my phone. I think it was like a Windows phone that I had back then. Found all of my contacts. Started emailing every single person. And like 30, yeah. 60 days later, I was making more money as a freelancer than as a full-time employee because I really reached out to every single person in my contact list, which reminds me of something that Alex Hormosi said in one of his reels. Like, you have a contact list on Google, email. I did that like in 2017, 2016, yeah. 2015, when it wasn't even something like mainstream, right? I called emailed every freaking person. I didn't even care if I had worked with them. I didn't care if they were family. I, I just emailed everyone, which is similar to what I did with you. Hey, let's hop on a call, right? I just did it. Why? Because what's the worst you can get? A no. Who gives a who cares? A no? Dude, the kids on gas are getting bombed right now. And you can't get a, a no? Like, dude, put things into context. Whenever you are fearful about something, I remember watching this reel literally yesterday that talks about that. There are two types of fear, the triggered and the real one. Triggered is like getting a no. The real one is, oh crap, I'm gonna get killed. 
there's a real danger here, right? Physical danger. Most fear is triggered. So when fear is triggered, you only have one way out. It's through the, through the fear, right? So it's not like I'm shameless in regards to, hey, hey, Tim, let's hop on a call. I'm like, okay, this guy is an authority. At least I believe you are, right? If you don't believe you are like that, you are authority. Copy blogger, I've read a bunch of, of stuff from that website. And I'm like, I have this guy basically on my contact list, right? Following me. Worst thing that can happen is he says no. And you said yes, and now we're talking. Just because the triggered fear of, oh, I'm gonna get a no. I just said, screw that. Worst things have happened to me. And I overcame all of these things. So whenever you are in a position where the fear is fake, triggered by some external event, sometimes internal tool with your emotions, Remember, the way through that is right through it. There's no other way. There's nothing else you could do. Action is the thing that, that brings um, not only success, but also destroys the fear. And destroying the fear is some kind of success, right? So even if you get the no, man, you try again next day. Sometimes when I do these podcasts, I feel you mentioned repeating the same thing over and over again. And I feel like I do that because I don't know another way other than consistency like i haven't found a hack or anything i just it's a, it's in my personality i'm very much just a do the same thing every day kind of person anyway like i wake up at the same time every day and i work out with my wife at the same time i basically eat the same stuff every day so i think i'm like a little bit inclined to be that way from my personality type however <clears throat> so what i'm getting at is in these podcasts, people are always looking for tactics, you know, they're like, what did you do? What kind of content did you post? Like, how did you build this thing up? And I would say, I just, I just did it every day. Like I've never missed a single day in like 14, 15 years. Right. But then there's this other side of me that makes me feel like in my heart of hearts, I still feel like I don't have a choice, you know, like something could happen at any moment, like th that moment. It's, it's, a, it's amazing what happens when you have no choice. Like you just have to figure it out. And all these years later, I still feel that way. Like something's coming to get me, you know, something's nipping at my heels. Like I have to figure this out. I don't have another choice. Do you relate to that at all? Not anymore. No. And let me tell you the curious you. story behind that. <laughs> How did you do it, man? <laughs> um, it's interesting. It's interesting. Let me tell you. When I was like fifth, Nah, like 12, I jumped over like a little wall and tripped and fall over my head. And I felt like a crack on my spine. Um, you know, kids, we just didn't care. It seems that that was the starting point of, I have a scoliosis in my back. So my back is like a mess, a little s. But it's enough to like screw me up. Nothing happened like for a decade. When I was 25, 26, I was doing like these... This exercise where you pull yourself up, pull-ups, I, I, don't, I don't know the name, but I did it wrong and I something tweaked, tweaked. And I had the worst pain in my life. I rendered useless for a month. And then when I was 32, something like that, I bought a gaming chair <laughs> and I sat too close to the edge and it flipped forward and it, you know, like Mario, bam, on my head. Oh, yeah. Dude, three months almost without like look, look into the side due to the pain, like in, in through the, the scoliosis, I hired a fitness coach from Twitter woman who kind of ironic, right? Because I usually work with, with usually when I hire like uh, people that for my body, it's, it's, it's a guy, but this time I hired a female and one day talking with her about business because she runs a coaching business. She mm. told me, Jose, you just told me that exactly that same thing that you just told me, that I'm always feeling like some, someone, something is going out to get me. You know, a little bit of par paranoid, let's call it like that, for, for a lack of a better word. Paranoid that shit is going to hit the fan and you're going to die from something. That's, I don't know about you, but I'm very high in neuroticism, meaning that everything like emotionally, I'm not the most stable person, but I'm not also like one of these 
crazy person that will just go out with a knife. Not, not, none of that because I'm very introspective. But creative people like us usually have that high neuroticism and, and anxiety and, oh, someone's on to get us. And she told me, you need to drop that because there's a very different, it's very different when you run away, away from problems than running towards goals. That's the literal yeah. words that she told me. It's a very different time a, a way. You've been running away from, for so long from problems and failure. And it's now time for you to give yourself the opportunity to run towards success. It took like a long time for me to like oh, accept that. I told her, yes, you're right. But now, like a year or two after that coaching session, which hadn't, she, they didn't pay her for that. I paid her for back, back things and back exercises. That little thing, for whatever reason, after a year or two, helped me overcome that. Someone's going out to get me. Tomorrow is going to be worse. I, dude, I just recently, my, my biggest client told me, hey, I can't pay you $10,000 a month anymore. And I'm like, ah, shit. <laughs> oh, I, I can only afford this amount. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. A big pay chunk, a big pay, like slash. But instead of me like, oh man, tomorrow I'm going to get fired by the other guys. First, it didn't happen. Secondly, like oh, two or three days later, one of my previous clients came back. And it's like, I'm not running away from fear anymore. I'm just, okay, today this happened. Tomorrow I'm going to do this and that and that and that and that and that. And now I'm back back again to the game, even though it, it, it happened like two or three weeks ago. So it took a while, but it's a different mindset when you are running away from problems than running towards success. And right now I'm running towards success. And despite the problems, I'll just, I'll figure it out. Because like you, it's consistency. I also eat the same things every day. My, my wife hates that. She hates it with all her soul. Um, my kids only think that I eat meat because they always see me eating like a big steak because I love steak. They really think that's the only thing I eat, but it's always the same thing. I wake up at 6, 6.55 a.m. I have a home gym down below. 7 a.m. I have some guy waiting for me, like the, my personal trainer. We train for an hour. I go back, I take a bath, and then I grind it out until I'm sick of it. Sometimes I don't want to work. I just don't work. Most times I enjoy it because I actually love being in front of the computer. I'm one of those weirdos, weirdos who too. prefer to be like <laughs> just connecting with this, like this. I actually enjoy these kind of like events more than actually meeting someone like in person for whatever reason. It's kind of weird, but I've met other people that are like that. They prefer the this kind of engagement than, than actually uh, meeting live and in person. But um, my wife also hates that. <laughs> <laughs> but it is what it is. It, that's how I overcame that. It, it's, it, 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 it just happened thanks to that coaching session that I had with, with that uh, coach. And it changed my life after like two years. <laughs> it was an instant. But that changed my, my opinions and my, and my thought process over a span of a year. Wow. It's amazing what, when you just keep your eyes open, messages come and life-changing experiences in this in a split second you know the minute before that you weren't by any means looking for some life coaching perspective changing message <laughs> you just got it and I, I think that's like a, it, yeah. a really important lesson yeah 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 um let's talk about the success that you're running towards i don't know the ins and outs of your, of your business i think that you have like a couple different avenues that you do um, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, but it appears to me like the main source of your business these days is is coaching. Um, is that correct? I, I don't want to make assumptions. Um, some months, <laughs> not every month, because coaching is one of these things that it's time intensive because I'm the kind of, of coach that will yeah. like be on top of you. Like, hey, where's the thing, right? And because of the time, in, it's so time intense and it's out of my control because I can't tell you I can't force you to do things. I only have like one or two clients per month right now. Right now, my main source of income is my service business, which is basically creating funnels for my client and then having the recurring revenue of or the recurring payments of we create the content for you and drive traffic to that specific funnel, which is how every person should be running their business, right? Create content, run it, run traffic to the funnel. And that is what I've been doing. Recently, I've been delving into web design once again because, you know, um, 
people pay really good for web design. It doesn't matter if artificial intelligence is there, people will still pay you ten, twenty thousand dollars for a website. And um, of course, if they had the finances, but it's mostly the, the agency. I call it marketing firm because everyone has an agency. So I prefer calling it a firm. But marketing <laughs> firm is my main source of income. And then I have the coaching, which is one or two clients charge anything between five, 10,000 grand for that for like two months of coaching. And then, of course, there's supplementary things with, with courses. I don't sell a lot of courses. I do make a few thousand dollars a month because I don't promote it that much. But whenever I promote it, it's like I can see the increase in, in the income. But the thing is that... Um, I would rather have the recurring revenue from the service-based business and sometimes the coaching than the course because courses is like, think about it. Yeah. Every click you get has a price, right? The course, let's say, costs $100. You have a, a 2% conversion rate. That means two people buy for every 100 click. Ah, oh, you just made $200. Wow. But then you have the service. Every new client is, I don't know, let's put a, a number to that, $10,000. Even 1% conversion rate of those 100 clicks that you get, it's 10,000 grand. You'll make more money from the service than from the freaking courses. Now, if you are like one of these super mega heroes, like, um, what's his name? Uh, Justin Welsh, I don't know if you've seen him, that drives traffic super like a mother heroes. flower. Yeah, or, or, or like um, Dan, uh, 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 Dan Cole, who just drives massive amount of traffic to her landing pages, then be my guest, sell courses. I don't drive that kind of traffic. So I would rather get paid $10,000 one time than $200 for every 100 clicks. That's how I see it. And a lot of people think it's the other way around. Ah, I want free money. Dude, it's not free money. <laughs> it's, you need to understand the math of, of, of conversion rate and click-through rate and all of these things. And then you can make a smarter decision. In my case, the smarter decision is the client work. Uh, I could totally go down this rabbit hole. I'm not going to because I think people are sick of hearing me talk about it. But man, I, I just, I totally agree. It doesn't make any sense to me why everybody wants to have, you know, high leverage. It's it's like the fancy word now. I want leverage. I'm like, why? Don't you just want money? You can just make <laughs> sales and make money as opposed to getting leverage. You know, like I, I, I don't get it. Um, and so I agree with you totally. So thank you for clarifying that. The reason why I was asking whether it's it's coaching or your your marketing firm is because here I am. I want to come back to this this idea of of calling people through social media. I know it's like it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it really, really stuck with me because I never put the dots together. For me, sales come from email. And social media is just a mechanism to drive traffic to an email list. And then I can either book the appointment through email or I can sell the product through email or whatever. And then when you, when you book that call with me, I was like, holy shit, like I can just do it right from the front of the funnel, the top end of the funnel. Um, and so my question is, I, I'm getting to a question, I promise. Is that how you make some of your sales? Do you just go straight Most from social sales, media? It's literally just, hey, let's hop on a call from Twitter or direct message. Or, or on Instagram. Yep. The, the, but so you don't see it as like a real specific sales mechanism. You're just building relationships. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Not with everyone because, for example, I really wanted to meet you. I didn't have anything to sell to you. Um, but if I had, you would have known already. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, that is part of the process, right? Um, engaging with people in direct messages, connecting with them. And if you're interested in actually selling them something, be transparent. Because it's building a relationship to yeah. only tell them then, hey, pay me money. It's like, oh, so that's what we're doing, Mother Flower. No, you, you'll destroy the relationship. But if you're transparent from the beginning, people, they'll accept whatever the, sell, whatever the hell you, you tell them. I almost always also clarify with people that I hop on a call. I tell them, like, this is not a sales call. It's I actually want to meet you. And no, I have no other motive. I'm, I won't be selling you anything in the future. None of that with the people that I actually want to build some kind of like this kind of relationship, people who want, who I want to get as client, I tell them, I want you as a client. Here's how yeah. I can help you. Let's hop on a call. And straightforward. It requires balls to do that. It's not like just from one day to another, you're going to be doing it because, well, imagine you, a 20 something year old hearing this with no experience at all, zero client testimonials, zero case study. How can you tell someone, I want you to be my client Let's hop on a call. Here's how I can help. 
you'll look ridiculous. People will screenshot that and will blast you on Twitter, which happens all the time. But if you have proof of cons proof of your work, you've been doing these things for a few years and you know that you can actually help that person, go for it. You have five, 10 years under your belt of experience, go for it. Be transparent. My, my friend, here's how I helped this guy, made this amount of money. I can help you achieve similar results. And are you interested? If not, ignore this message. That is the direct message I send when I'm selling coaching. Literally, <laughs> just like that. And when, I, and when I started using it, I got like, that's first week, I got like 10 calls and closed like five people for $10,000, $20,000 each. Just doing that dumb shit, which is kind of, I, kind of stupid because people think that there's some kind of magic behind sending messages. Just be transparent. I want to help you with this. Here's what we could do. Let's hop on a call or ignore this. And then just follow up if you want to keep uh, pestering that client or potential client. No magic, pure balls. And of course, the testimonials and the case studies that actually prove that what you do work. If you have those, go ahead. Worst case scenario, you get a no. Worst case scenario, someone screenshots your stuff and then you retweet them and say, yes, I can help you with that. Interested, book the call. And you just double down. Aren't you an expert? You know what to do, right? You know how to fix problems. You won't be offering things that um, you know you can't do. On the contrary, you'll do the things that you actually promise. And that's how you grow a brand, right? You deliver on your promises. Other people refer you. I got a client yesterday just like that that was referred by another client. $7,500 right there on a, on a 20 minute call. Not great payday for one day that I, I don't even do the work because it's, it's my graphic designer who does all of that. So now I have that client. 30 days from now, he'll have a new website. And I'm like, I'm happy. From my side, it was 20 minute investment. Maybe an hour when I like manage the project. For one hour, getting paid $75,000? Every day, right? I firmly believe that the biggest thing holding, <clears throat> let's assume that people have a skill, right? So let's assume that you're good at something. I firmly believe that the biggest thing holding those people back is the willingness or unwillingness to ask, to ask for a sale. You seem very, very comfortable talking about money. And I, I didn't grow up with money. I was pretty terrified to talk about it. I was like really scared of it, honestly. Um, I, I had to read books and like really train myself to get comfortable in having those conversations. But the more and more I've done it, the more I've 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 just I've come to believe that the unwillingness to ask and to have that uncomfortable moment, or even sometimes like, do you want to get started? And then somebody takes a second to think about it and people just can't handle it. They go like, oh, well, okay, if you don't want to, maybe we could take like two thousand dollars off or something like that. You know, like those moments that it's a it's a skill, yes, but it's also like a tolerance. It's like a discomfort tolerance that that I've built. Like I said, I made an observation. You, you seem very comfortable talking about money. I know from firsthand experience, you seem very comfortable approaching people. W where did that come from? Did you have to build that muscle or were I you always like it. that? I'm, I'm very, you might see me like with, I, this is my podcast personality, <laughs> okay? But I usually <laughs> have like a dog face like that. My wife always said like, you have a bulldog face, Jose, because it's, it's, it's like the, the psycho face that wants to like stab you to death. That's my regular face. My voice is a little bit also, my, this is my real demeanor, right? Very chill, but that's not entertaining. So I've learned how to become a little bit more uh, upbeat. But let me tell you, after the podcast is uh, it's done, I have to go to my bed and lie <laughs> for like an hour. <laughs> because this is not my, my baseline. My baseline is like, you'll get bored to death. It's like watching like a, a wall dry, <laughs> like you just painted a, 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 a wall. That's my personality, a dry, a, a recently painted wall that you're just watching dry. But it's, I've learned that that doesn't sell, that doesn't make money, that doesn't entertain people. So I've developed that kind of persona, right? And I get into, into, a, into a, I get into, I role play. I'm role playing right now, the, the, the charismatic or more, I'm not super charismatic, but the more charismatic Jose Rosal. Um, and I, I think I got that from my dad because he's very, when he's, he's, uh, he gives speeches and I've seen his giving speech, giving speeches for years. He's actually a deacon in the Catholic church. So he's always in front of people. And I, I you know, you, you learn from your parents just by watching them. 
So right Don't now worry. I'm all of these hand moves and it's, it's literally copying my dad. So I've learned how to tra how to use all these little things that I've learned over the years to to do these things. But it's not something that I enjoy doing every day. I wouldn't hop on a podcast every week. It, it'll kill me. So what I've realized is that you've got to do what you've got to do uh, with the resources that you have. I didn't have a lot of resources. My parents were like middle, lower middle class in the Dominican Republic, which is it's not middle class. Like if you put it in the United States, that it's poor, okay? But here in the Dominican Republic, since it's a little bit different, um, lower middle class is not poor. You can still have a nice lifestyle. I've never went hungry, never. I didn't have everything I wished as a kid, but who did, right? Um, but anyhow, all of these little things that I've learned from my dad and my parents and just being screwed by life in many occasions, I've learned how to use these things online. Um, it's not comfortable. For me, hopping on a podcast is not the most comfortable comfortable thing. Um, showing my face is not the most comfortable thing. I have my own insecurities. I'm one of these people that is always, you know, like, how do you call this when you, like, put your, like, like suck your belly in? Yeah, I'm one of these people because of whatever. I'm not even fat, right? But still, I have that, that dumb insecurity, which I haven't found a way to overcome, despite not having, like, a big tummy. But... I'm just a regular guy who decided to say pe to tell people, "Hey, buy my shit." <laughs> like literally, sometimes I, I, I sometimes I'm, I, it's embarrassing when I hop like in a, on a DM and I tell like a friend, "Hey, I have the service, buy it," and they say like, "Dude, at least say hi," you know. And I feel bad afterwards, <laughs> but um, I've stopped doing that. But um, I only stopped doing it because I realized that some people just didn't like it like that. So I, I've you know I've solved them first. I make them a little bit more receptive to the message. And then, hey, let's hop on a call. Here's a few things that I would love to show you to see if we can work together. If not, that's okay. But dude, it's a process, bro. You have to do it even if you're uncomfortable, which is referring back to the beginning, the triggered fear, right? That triggers your fear. The only way is through that fear. Like a friend told me, the solution to the problem is the problem itself. You don't have yeah. big muscles. Well, the, the problem is you don't have big muscles. So how do you fix that problem? You know, lifting weights. You're fat, mm -hmm. same thing. You're stupid, read more books. You don't have money. Dude, that's I, not having money. It's, if you think about it, it's, it's one of these gifts. <laughs> no matter how, it's, it, you'll understand. It's one of these gifts that sometimes you see as like a curse. Not having money at the beginning was one of the biggest things that drove me into doing the things that I do today. Writing shit in Spanish and Google translating it into English was because I was broke as hell. So I had no other way. It was the only way. I said to myself, I don't want to be working for other people. I need a personal brand. Let's do things in Spanish. Google translate them. I remember writing it in Facebook in Spanish for my Facebook uh, page, which is in Spanish, and then Google translating it, posting it on Twitter, and people started buying my shit. And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> Oh, wow, it worked. And um, I don't translate anymore because I speak more English than Spanish today in age because everything I do is in English. But it was because of all these little things that has happened in my life. So you could use that as an excuse or you could use it as a rationale to do the things that you think you shouldn't be doing or you're too fearful to do. I think there's a big difference between fear and discomfort. And I think in a lot of ways, people avoid discomfort even more than they yeah. avoid fear because discomfort like never goes away. You know, it's just kind of nagging. And um, yeah, I, I just, I think about this a lot. I know I'm kind of pausing and trying to, to get my thoughts, but I, I genuinely think about discomfort all the time and about how it's, it's really just the only secret to a successful life is just willingness to um, not just go towards discomfort, but I think it was because I wrestled, you know, I think I learned this lesson because I was a wrestler in, in high school and it, the state that I'm from in Pennsylvania, the, the wrestlers there are just no joke. They start wrestling when they're like four or five years old. And there's, oh. there's a, a slogan, which the wrestlers will know called eat the frog, where you just do the hardest thing first. You just eat the frog and like you embrace discomfort. And, um, yeah, I, I think that really, really is the case. And, and like you said, it's it's been a gift 
for me and I'm grateful for it. You know, uh, on the topic of discomfort, I like throwing money towards it. For example, I hired a personal trainer for, for the f going to the gym because for sure. uh, before that I went to the gym, but I almost never go, never go to the gym because it's like, even though it's like literally in front of me, like I have my home gym down below and then like a f like a hundred steps from my home, there's a literal gym. So it's literally just crossing the street and I have a freaking gym right there yeah. and I didn't go. <laughs> so what I did was throw money to the discomfort and, and told one of the um, trainers, hey, come to my house, train me here. So now the guy is always waiting me at 7 a.m. there. And since he is here in my home, I have no other excuse. I have to be there. So um, it's one of these, these little things that people don't even think about. There's so many ways to overcome discomfort. It's not comfortable. But now, here's the thing. My responsibility with that guy that came from his home to my house is bigger yep. than my desire to stay at, in bed. Yep. So you need, to find, you need to find what gives you more momentum, more, more, more um, drive towards whatever you want. And that's strong enough that it's more up here than the comfort that you want. I would rather be in bed at 7 a.m., but I have the responsibility with my trainer who is there, who came from his house like an hour away from here, and I have to do it. That's why I'm a big proponent of coaching. If you're not very consistent, pay the coach. Just paying the coach will drive you into like, okay, I have to do it. Oh, this guy's pestering me. Okay, let's do it. And then you develop that consistency and stuff like that. So it's not an easy thing like to sit down and, and say like, how can I overcome this discomfort? Don't overcome it. Find a way to drive yourself to something that it's more pleasurable or more or gives you more like, ah, oh, I should do it than the, the, than the discomfort. I just throw money at it. Not everything works like that, but the personal trainer helped me with it. Very totally. I, I also agree with the idea of everybody having a coach. I think the best examples of that is actual you, fitness you've people. You've hired like, a lot of coaches, my, right? Yeah, like my Muay Thai coaches have coaches and they're so good, but there's a mental thing with it where <clears throat> I remember talking to, to one of them where it's, it's like impossible to do without somebody keeping you accountable. And maybe some people have the discipline for it, but even still, why make it that much harder on yourself? Because when there's just somebody waiting for you, I don't know, there's, it's, like a, it's, yeah. a, it's a mental trick. Yeah, that I, I agree with you totally. Um, man, I, I wish I planned more time for this. I'm just, I'm so enjoying this conversation. Uh, unfortunately, we gotta, we gotta wrap this thing up. I gotta do something with my son. I hope you can come back. Uh, seriously, like, I, just, I feel like there's so much more. I feel like there's so like much more. Like in two weeks, we can talk when about. I, <laughs> like I, when I, <laughs> as I told you, like I, 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 I'm, I'm wasted after a podcast. So I don't take podcasts like every week. So in two weeks, we can talk again. Yeah. <laughs> You need a two week recovery, recovery yeah. <laughs> process. All right. Love to hear it. Um, all right. Well, let's do the, um, the, the end of the podcast show notes. You're big on Twitter. You're big on Instagram, by the way, all of uh, Jose's links is his Instagram profile, his Twitter profile, even your LinkedIn profile and your website. They will all be on the show notes um, on copybloggerpod.com. You can go to the website. You can sign up for the newsletter. We send out all of the episodes um, with, little dictations so that you can get the best bits of the podcast if you don't have time to listen to the whole thing. Um, but, but please, Jose, where, where's the best place to find you? Is it your website? In my home, my friend. Nah, it's actually um, on Twitter. <laughs> it's actually on Twitter. I spend more time on Twitter nice. than anything else. So if you like shoot me a DM on Twitter or, or reply to one of my tweets, I'll pay attention almost instantly. Instagram, it's just for the kicks. I don't go to Instagram to, to learn. It's just uh, real, real, real. Waste my time. Yeah, Set, forget about work. LinkedIn, I hate it, but it's necessary. But you won't find me mm. doing a lot of things yet. And YouTube, it's all like Jose Rosado. You'll find e everything from me. Rosado.io, Jose Rosado on Google. You'll find everything. I'm almost always the first guy because it's, un it's an uncommon name. The only person I know that has better SEO than me, it's a... Uh, 
a, a baseball player who has the same name. Before that, Don't it worry. was like a pornography photographer, <laughs> but I displaced <laughs> him. <laughs> I displaced the porn, which is kind of, yeah. it's a success, bro. Displacing porn, it's like oh, my life achievement. <laughs> Yeah, it's something like 90 of the top 100 uh, most SEO websites in the world are all porn sites. So you, you yeah, have to there's work a guy that, that shoots porn, on name, his uh, photograph porn and got naked it, people. It. <laughs> my, that's my Too same funny. name. <laughs> Too funny. All right, man. Like I said, I, I, I really wish I booked more time for this. Um, I'm enjoying this so much. Thank you so much for your time, Jose. Uh, I hope we can do this again. I know that I know that the people listening to this are going to have so much they can take away from it just because you're such a grounded, like down to earth, practical person. Um, I think that's great. Uh, all right, let's wrap this thing up. Um, copybloggerpod.com to sign up, Jose. Once again, my friend, thank you. Adios. <laughs>